What is up, you guys? It is Jake with BaltimoreBeatdown.com here, bringing you a quick little video here in this glorious divisional round week. We have finally made it. The Ravens have finally won a playoff game under Lamar Jackson. It is a glorious feeling, isn't it, my friends? Uh, it's a relief. It's joy. It's a lot of different things, but uh, we really can't focus on that too much right now, can we? That's kind of the uh, weird part about the NFL playoffs is that there's another game coming up this week, and it's going to be this Saturday night against the Buffalo Bills up in Orchard Park. Bills Mafia going to be absolutely jumping and uh, ready to take on the challenge that is this Ravens team that appear to be bucking their heads at just the right time. Saturday night, man. It's all right for fighting. Many people have said. A lot of people say Saturday night fever, whatever you want to call it. I'm sure whatever telecast has it is going to be working all those puns into there. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the Ravens and the Bills in this game. Figures to be a pretty fun one. You know, the two guys, the two quarterbacks from the 2018 class that a lot of people had question marks uh, in with Lamar Jackson and Josh Allen. Uh, the two guys that have, funny enough, kind of proven themselves to be the best QBs from that class, I think, uh, pretty much without a doubt at this point. But, you know, there's not going to be too much love lost on the field between them on Saturday, I think, as they have a job to do. They're trying to beat one another. They're trying to advance the AFC championship game. How can the Ravens do that? Well, there's going to be plenty of in-depth analysis from plenty of outlets, ours included, our podcast included later in the week. We're going to have a full episode on it, but I wanted to give you guys a quick little video here. Decided to throw something together, breaking down the three keys to beating the Buffalo Bills, beating Buffalo, whatever you want to call it, on Saturday night. The first key to me for the Ravens is staying patient. So the game against Tennessee, I think it played out in a way that, you know, we really weren't expecting. I think a lot of people were expecting maybe the Ravens to lose you know, a similar heartbreak to the last couple of years. And then the people that were expecting a win seem to be expecting them to go out there and make a statement, you know, double digit type of win, 38, 24, something like that really didn't work out that way at all. And that can be attributed, I think, to the Ravens kind of panicky, anxiety filled start. It sort of felt kind of like the last two years all over again, where you have the defense sort of giving up big plays to A.J. Brown, Marlon Humphrey getting victimized a little bit. He gives up a touchdown, puts them up 10-0. Lamar Jackson throws an early interception uh, to Malcolm Butler. Just a really, really terrible interception. And it's like, man, what is going on here? Is this just kind of last year all over again? It certainly felt like it. Uh, but I think as far as staying patient, they were able to do so on both sides of the ball. And that's really what helped propel them to victory, or at least what helped get them back into that game. And then that propelled them to victory. On offense specifically, they did a couple of things that I think both Greg Roman and Lamar Jackson deserve a ton of credit for. For Lamar, I think psychologically bouncing back from that interception was huge and kind of not trying to do too much beyond that because on that play, he was certifiably trying to do too much. So kind of just the ability to settle in and start to take what the defense gave him a little bit. A lot of Hollywood Brown to the flats, uh, a lot of just taking his check down when it was there and scrambling for it as well. And I think... Ultimately, what got them into that game or back into that game, I should say, was the long 49 yard touchdown run on third and nine, I believe, from Lamar Jackson. But you don't want to have to rely on that stuff to get you back into a game. And from then on out, I think their patience and kind of their maturity from all that adversity they had weathered that people talked about is part of what propelled them forward. Early on in the game, you had, and here's a point that kind of is a credit to both Roman and Jackson. You had Lamar getting stopped on these veer option keepers over and over and over again by the Titans. And it really proved to be kind of a hamper to the Ravens offense early because Lamar getting moving and, you know, kind of moving the chains with his own feet opens things up for the other running backs and opened things up for the passing game as well. At least it had over the previous five weeks in which the offense was sort of getting back into the form that we saw them in 2019, but it wasn't there early for them. And I think as a, it's a credit to their patience that Things weren't working in the first half for them, but what Greg Roman does is he comes out of the locker room with a clear plan in mind, a clear script to get Pat Ricard of all people involved. That really helped them go on a touchdown drive there. Coming out of the half, that was huge. And sticking with what wasn't working and kind of sticking with his process and staying patient uh, and sticking with his plan is ultimately what won the Ravens this game. A couple late, really huge runs from Lamar came on that veer option that had gotten stopped. So a huge credit to the offense in that respect, I think. And as far as the defense, I mean, they came into the game with the plan to stop Derrick Henry and stop him they did. I mean, he had his worst game in a couple of years for sure. And 
especially I think it might have been easy for the defense to get a little bit frustrated with A.J. Brown making big plays in the passing game, Marlon Humphrey getting disrespected a little bit. It would have been pretty easy, I think, to just kind of sit back and say, yeah, you know what, we're going to go away from our plan here as far as stopping Derrick Henry. We're going to shift more resources to A.J. Brown. It didn't really work out like that. They switched Jimmy Smith over to A.J. Brown. He did a great job against them, but they just stuck with that plan to stop Henry, and I think it ultimately wore the Titans' offense down a little bit. I think it limited what they could do, and uh, it proved to be a very, very effective strategy for the Ravens' defense, who came into that game fired up and ready to go. And uh, I think it just shows, again, patience by Wink Martindale to stick to his plan and uh, adjust where he needed to. It's not like they were just doing the exact same thing the entire game, but big game from Derek Wolf, who had a sack, big game from Kalias Campbell, who was all jacked up, and a big game from Deshaun Elliott as well, who was getting up there and mixing it up in the run game. So I think just from a psychological kind of meta perspective, the Ravens staying patient is what kept them in that game. I think what is going to be especially important about that in a game like Buffalo is that with the Titans, there's a little bit of a margin for error because as good as their offense is, and even though they didn't necessarily look it against Baltimore only scoring 13 points, their offense is legit. I think that's just a credit to how the Ravens defense played. But as far as the other side of the ball goes, Buffalo's defense is very legit. They're talented, they're quick, they're physical, and they're going to be a tough matchup for this Ravens offense. And there might not be a chance for, you know, the Ravens to get off to a slow start offensively and then rely on some miraculous run by Lamar and then just kind of chip your way back into it. I think you're going to need a clean, complete game from the offense in this one. So you have to stay patient. You have to take what the defense is giving you, and you have to consistently move the ball and score points here. Sounds like obvious stuff, but in the previous two playoff matchups before this one we just watched, the Ravens hadn't done that, and it cost them. Obviously, we're in brave new worlds in the post-Lamar Jackson playoff win era, but you have to emphasize the fundamentals here. So stay patient is number one for me. My number two key here is to emphasize the money down. So looking across the aisle at the forthcoming opponent here in the Bills and their game against the Colts last week, it's definitely going to be a tough game, but Indianapolis hung tough with them. And Indianapolis is a team that the Ravens in turn were able to hang tough with uh, back during the regular season. And I think the Colts hanging tough with the Bills It's a little bit of a credit to the patience that they did show, but also them giving the game away is kind of an indictment on the patience that they didn't. Um, The offense that they have is built around Phillip Rivers. That means short to intermediate passing uh, attacks that kind of scheme guys open a little bit more than a sum of its parts type deal. You know, you got a strong two-headed monster of a running game with Naheem Hines and Jonathan Taylor, and it's all kind of built around that really strong offensive line that they have. And not for nothing, you know, Indy stuck to what they were doing well early on, and they were moving the ball, you know, against this really athletic, stout Bills defense. Um, It was kind of an impressive performance, except for the fact that they didn't score enough. They only had three points on their first two drives. It doesn't really seem like it's going to be the end of the world, but the drive after they kick their first field goal, Buffalo comes out and Josh Allen starts doing the... uh, Things that, uh, you know, showcase why he's such a special player and why he's had such a great season. And you see the touchdown that he has where he kind of flicks it to Dawson Knox. All of a sudden, Indy is down seven to three, and it's a little bit of a different ball game. You can tell the Colts start to tighten up a little bit, uh, or at least they seem to. You never really know. But from a spectator's perspective, that's just kind of what I was seeing. And uh, it did seem like that watching the game as well. The game flow just seemed to change a little bit from that point on. You know, you had some drops uh, by the Colts. You had low percentage deep shots. It's certainly not Indy's bread and butter. You know, these low percentage kind of throws uh, is not what they do. They like to scheme guys open. Zach Paschal, uh, Michael Pittman, T.Y. Hilton. Uh, the shot was to Hilton, I believe. They almost connected on him, but they didn't. And the margins are really thin here. So you have to convert these opportunities, of course. But really, I think what kind of cost them a little bit is just kind of the fourth down decision making in this game. And I'm certainly not one that's going to knock aggression as a concept. I'm very pro-aggression, especially in a game like this. Frank Reich, Colts coach, he's no stranger to gambling a little bit. I think Edge Sports actually ranked him as their fourth best head coach in 2020 in the decision-making category. So he's obviously, you know, shown a a little bit of cojones. He's shown uh, an ability to decide when the opportunity or the time is right to go for it on fourth down and they were ready to do it in this game which I commend them for but it just didn't seem like they had kind of a great plan for the money downs Um, there was kind of a little bit of a panicky feel uh, as to how they were lining up and how they executed them in some cases specifically we can look at one of them uh, I think and that would be their first fourth down decision that they made where you have fourth and goal from the fourth from the four yard line 
Uh, the Colts are up 10-7 to 7 at this point, actually. And what they're trying to do, score a touchdown here, go up 17-7. to 7. Not necessarily into the locker room with the lead because there was still t- two minutes or so left on the clock and the Bills were going to have a chance to drive, but basically trying to make a statement there with a touchdown. So a staple of the Colts offense is uh, crossers that eventually tend to get somebody open here due to defenders kind of getting lost in the wash. Sort of pick plays, sort of not. Um, definitely pick plays, but uh, on this play, you know, this fourth and four, fourth and goal from the four, I guess you would call it. It seems to be the plan to scheme number 11, Michael Pittman, open. But uh, you can see here Matt Milano, number 58, the linebacker. He does a really good job recognizing that. He stays with the play, and he causes Rivers to be just kind of a hair late on the throw there. And the margin is super slim, and it's a play call that seems to rely on a few different things happening uh, to ultimately work. Not to mention the fact that you know the Colts are 19th in the league among teams that ran empty sets. And that's something you'd expect for a team with a 37-year-old immobile quarterback in Phillip Rivers, but that basically just is another factor that shows you how low percentage a play like that is, how you know, you're relying on all these different factors and waiting for guys to get open. It's like you probably should have had a little bit of a better play call ready to go here. And again, this is me Monday morning quarterbacking it, whatever you want to call it. I try not to do that very often, but it just seems like the ends did not justify the means in this case, even though I usually am a, you know, intent justifies whatever with fourth down. I'm a big go for it on fourth down guy, but you just, you have to have a plan and you have to execute. And if you hit it, you're the smartest guy in the world. And if you don't, then you're the dumbest guy in the world. I don't make those rules. It's just how it is, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, ultimately that is the difference between, like I said, going up 17 to seven and then being down 14 to 10, which is ultimately what happens. You know, they do not get that fourth down. Josh Allen drives the length of the field With 20 seconds left on the clock, he punches it in to go up 14 to 10. Then the Bills, in turn, take the lead into the locker room. And that is kind of the difference in this game sometimes, or in these games sometimes, I should say. It can come down to decisions like that. So, of course, I'm not saying don't go for it on fourth down. The Ravens are a very aggressive team in their own right, and they're going to be. But you have to emphasize having a plan and being ready and having play calls ready. And unfortunately, uh, you know, I'm sorry, the analysis comes down to you just have to be ready for third and fourth down. But like I said, it's a very critical thing and a very fundamental thing that you just need to be ready for. And I would say I'm fairly confident that the Ravens are going to be. Uh, In fact, they had one of the gutsiest calls of this past weekend uh, with that fourth down that they faced late in the Titans game, where you have a little J.K. Dobbins uh, flat route to the right where he is sort of picked open by Willie Sneed, a little bit of a ticky-tack OPI call, costs them, and ultimately, I mean, that would have been a decision to close the game out, and the Ravens seem to have that call ready and waiting to go when they needed it. So I'm expecting them to be ready for third and fourth down, but I think they're definitely going to need to be if they want to walk into Orchard Park and win this weekend. Number three is kind of another sort of meta 30,000-foot view, and that is to know what to prioritize on defense. So the Bills, they're they're flush with offensive talent this season. It's not something that we're used to saying, but Brandon Bean has completely rebuilt this roster and he's made it a modern roster and a modern offense. And I think that all starts up there with big Josh Allen behind center. And his development the last couple of years, it's been really fun to watch. You know, he was a guy who, like I said, came into the league, not getting a ton of respect from uh, so-called draft experts or uh, whatever you want to call them. But uh, he's really developed his game. And this year in particular, it has been a rocket ship type leap. And that commands plenty of respect, I think. And the Ravens defense would be wise to show him that respect. And I think they're going to. I mean, he's a guy who is a threat with his legs. He's got a cannon for an arm. He's very physical. And uh, Wink Martindale is going to have these guys ready to rock. You know, Indy's defense, they hit him six times. Uh, They sacked him twice for 23 yards. Ideally, you're going to want to bring him down more if you're the Ravens. Uh, That's obviously a very basic kind of, of course, you want to sack the quarterback type deal, but you'd like to get home and bring him down. But the Ravens have had issues doing that this season to begin with. So we're going to see what happens in that respect. So if you can't, basically, you need to know what you have to prioritize. And I think that starts with his number one weapon in Stephon Diggs. So Allen had a passer rating of 115.5 during the regular season targeting Diggs. Their connection has been absolutely red hot, I believe. Uh, Diggs went for over 1,500 yards this season. He's been an absolute beast and worthy of the pickup uh, over this past offseason. And he's the guy who has proven to be the linchpin in the passing game for them. You've got Cole Beasley, you've got John Brown, you've got Dawson Knox, like I said. But these guys are all sort of the ancillary rotating cast behind Diggs, who is the guy that you have to watch out for, obviously. So in two of the Bills' three losses this year, he got held under 100 yards. 
and 100 yards, I mean, it sounds like a pretty solid watermark uh, for a wide receiver in 2020, obviously, but it does indicate a little bit of the fact that his production is kind of tied to this team being able to win. And if you look at the game last week, he had six catches for 128 yards and a touchdown, and he was converting these money downs over and over again for the Bills and just being an absolute weapon. So you have to key on him for sure. He lines up all over the field, uh, including in the slot. So it's going to be tough to tell as far as like sticking him with a guy. I think he's a guy who I mentioned A.J. Brown is not a great matchup for Marlon Humphrey. I think Diggs would be a guy that he could hang with a little bit. So potentially sticking him with Marlon Humphrey and just saying our best guy versus your best guy. Let's see who wins. But also being adaptive if you're Wink Martindale, if that's not working, don't be afraid to do what you did against A.J. Brown and maybe swap other guys in, maybe roll a double coverage over that way and then put Humphrey on their second option. Who knows? But also as far as emphasizing that other point in stopping Josh Allen, his passing chart indicates some bias throwing the ball to the right, which, you know, he's a right-handed quarterback, nothing super unexpected there, but it does indicate something can possibly be exploited. And that's just sort of trying to take away that right side of the field, force him to go to the left, uh, a lot of right-handed quarterbacks do have issues throwing to the left, but just emphasizing that and sticking with Diggs, I think is going to be the two main points for this defense, just prioritizing those top two options and saying, you know what, if you want to beat us with Cole Beasley or Dawson Knox or John Brown or Devin Singletary in the running game, you go ahead and do that because this is an offense that is super high powered and they're probably going to get theirs at some point in some way. But basically, if you're Wink Martindale, it comes down to saying, if you want to beat us with your top two guys, we can live with that. We're going to prioritize stopping those guys, letting you do what you want with the other ones and try to keep you out of the end zone as much as you can. It's a Bill Belichick sort of way of thinking. You know, there's been certain examples of him allowing running games to go wild on his defense uh, to stop a passing attack and vice versa. Just sort of taking away what they do best, forcing them to do something that makes them a little bit uncomfortable, especially for a guy like Josh, who, like Lamar, is inexperienced in a playoff game. So. You know, Wink Martindale is 1-0 against Josh Allen. Maybe he's got some tricks up his sleeve. Uh, but adding Diggs into that mix, that's a whole nother element. So you've got to be ready for both of them, and you have to prioritize the two of them in this weekend, obviously. So we're, of course, several days out, and there's going to be a lot of deeper analysis that we have ready for you guys on the website. But these are just sort of my early thoughts formulating. As I think about this game, just sort of some bird's-eye view type stuff. And that is, of course, to stay patient, number one to emphasize the money downs, number two, and to know what to prioritize on the defensive side of the ball, number three. We're going to be breaking it down more and further as I watch more tape, as Spencer watches more tape. We're going to be talking about it on the podcast, and plenty of our great writers are going to be talking about it on the website as well. So be sure to stick with Baltimore Beatdown for more analysis heading into the divisional round weekend for the NFL. Ravens sticking on the bills on Saturday night. It is going to be a fun one, and uh, we'll, of course, talk to you guys more about it later and uh, analyze it for you after it is over. But until then, talk to you guys later.